Amen. Amen. I, I'm not sure if I wanted to tell you this, but I'm going to go and tell you. I just literally spilt coffee all over my Bible and my manuscript. So give me just a second here. I think we're good. No, 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 we're good. I think we're good. <laughs> I've had this Bible for a long time. Now it's going to be a little brown, and it's going to be okay. All right, we're good. Good morning. Good morning on this fine Pentecost Sunday. I want to tell you that I am a bit disappointed or dismayed as to how few of you have signed up for teams. Now, I realize this. I take this into account. Many of you already serve in other ways. You lead a gospel community, or you help with Icon, or you're already a greeter. But some of you are merely consumers, and and I want you to step into uh, the active role of being a participant, a part of the family, you know, Figuratively speaking, making meals and cleaning the sink and, 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 and doing all the stuff that goes along with being an active participant in the family of God, the, bio, uh, the, the, the church. And so uh, I just expected, uh, Billy, and I, Billy and I talked about this teams thing, and I just expected that there'd be a mad rush to the, to the table. There hasn't been yet, but, but maybe, maybe, maybe today there will be. I'd love to see that. Uh, many, many of you say to me, uh, man, you're excited about what God's going to do next at River Church and, and how, how the, the, uh, the city really needs uh, River Church and how we, we just expect it, looking forward to God growing and building and moving in us and through us. Well, participation in that is, is really, really vital to us, being healthy and active and effective as a church. So go back and sign up for teams. Hey, so again, today's Pentecost Sunday, as Billy rightly said, it is not the birthday of River Church. That is uh, Labor Day. That's when we got started a number of years ago. Uh, But the church universal and throughout time, the church that is not um, necessarily bound by this time-space continuum that we live in. In other words, there, the, the, the church that, is, that has been for the last 2,000 years uh, made up of human beings, uh, most of who are now gone and at home with Jesus, that church was birthed 2,000 years ago, and that's what we're celebrating today. Um, what does the word Pentecost even mean? Why do we use that word Pentecost. The, uh, the, 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 the Koine Greek word pentekonta, pentekonta is translated into English as Pentecost, but pentekonta simply means 50. So if this is day 50, then we were to, so we would count back 50 days. What do you think we would come to if we counted back 50 days ago? It's actually 49 days ago, seven weeks ago. What do you think we would, what do you think we would, we would find on the calendar? Somebody just guess out loud. What happened 49 days ago? What do we call that? Yes, what do we call that day? We call that Easter Resurrection Sunday, right. So interestingly, I mean, I find this quite interesting, <clears throat> God determined that, that on, on this, this, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but there, on this day of, there was a day of celebration in the, the Jewish uh, fest, uh, festival calendar, and it was called Passover. And Passover was uh, a pilgrimage celebration. That means <clears throat> that that during Passover, this is before Jesus ever went to the cross, Passover annually, hundreds of thousands, at least, that's a very conservative estimate, Passover weekend, every year, hundreds of thousands of Jews would pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So think on this. 
God in his creativity, God in his sovereignty, determined that, that his son's sacrificial act on the cross would happen on Passover weekend. Why? Well, I believe so that the, the maximum number of people might actually see this event, the gruesome crucifixion of Jesus, and they might be confronted by that. Like, wow, that's pretty heavy. What is that about? So, so, so God amassed an audience in Jerusalem um, on, on, on Passover, on the Passover weekend, so that Jesus might be crucified on that weekend, that, that the maximum number of Jews might, might see that. Now, 50 days later in Jerusalem, 49 days later, seven weeks later, another festival happens in Jerusalem. Again, we're talking, we're talking uh, the, the Jewish tradition that had been going on for many, many years before Jesus ever came on the scene. 49 days after Passover, this Jewish pilgrimage celebration, 49 days, seven weeks later, is another feast, and it's another pilgrimage uh, festival. It's called the Festival of the Weeks. Now we call it Pentecost, but, but really, the Jews didn't so much call it Pentecost. That's, more of a, that's what we call that Sunday, but, but they called it the Festival of the Weeks or the, the Festival of the Harvest, and what they were doing 49 days after Pentecost, I mean, after Passover, uh, they are now celebrating the grain harvest. And it's called a renewal of their covenant. And it is the next, um, it is the next pilgrimage celebration. So once again, 49 days later, several hundred thousand, again, a conservative estimate, several hundred thousand Jews not only from Israel, but displaced Jews, Jews that lived in other countries, Jews that actually had other languages in which they were more comfortable in than Hebrew, Jews from, from all over the region, 49 days later, Festival of, festival of the Weeks, the Harvest Festival, they would come back for another pilgrimage. So now God has amassed a large crowd again that he might do something Again, miraculous. So they would get together for, the Jews would get together in Jerusalem for the Festival of the Weeks, for the Harvest Festival. Uh, they would celebrate the, 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 the grain that they had just harvested. Uh, in contrast to Passover, I find some of these historical facts to be super interesting. In contrast to the, uh, the Passover festival where they were to avoid all leaven, um, the, the, the grain festival or the, the festival of the weeks actually included leaven. So now they can use leaven in the baking, in the eating, in, in the, the celebrating. Last little, last little fact. Uh, they would, part of, the, part of the, uh, the festival, part of the celebration, when they would come to Jerusalem and they would go to the temple to celebrate the festival of the weeks, part of that uh, celebration including the reading of the book of Ruth. Now, if you're an astute Bible reader, you, you, might, you might pick up on why. Remember, because Ruth, part of the, the big part of the story was that she would go out and, and she would glean the, the leftover grain, and that was part of the big story and the big romance of the, of, of the book of Ruth. And so you can see why it's the Grain Harvest Festival. They read as a part of the celebration the book of Ruth. Okay, so God amasses, 49 days later, amasses another audience that he might do something miraculous. And what he does is he pours out what's called in the Bible uh, the baptism with or of or in the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're talking about today. And I want to, I want to excite you. I, I want you to be hope filled as a result of this passage. Romans 15 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with the hope or with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit comes to, to, to give you hope. I want you to be encouraged today. What I don't want you to be is freaked out. I spent too much of my, especially my, my early life, I spent too many years being freaked out by the Holy Spirit. And I had friends, they weren't, you know, I had friends who, who, who grew up in, you know, Pentecostal and charismaniac sort of environments, and like their stories freaked me out, and I read the actual story in the Bible of the Holy Spirit, and that freaked me out, and I frankly wasn't sure I had wanted any part of that. I was cool with God the Father, I was cool, cool with Jesus, didn't know what to do with the Holy Spirit. Especially, well, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so anyway, uh, I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to, we're not going to do anything today that's uh, weird other than having cake at the end of the church. That's a little different, but we're not going to do anything weird. Uh, nothing that's going to make you unnecessarily uncomfortable. I mean, the Bible always makes me uncomfortable. And so in that sense, maybe you're uncomfortable. We're not going to do anything that is going to unnecessarily make you uncomfortable. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit um, Many of us, somebody, somebody just, just, a, just a minute ago, who, a brand new friend of mine said that, that he had he'd grown up Southern Baptist. I grew up Southern Baptist. Some of us in this room grew up Southern Baptist. We love, we love the Baptists. We love baptism. Uh, most of you in here have been baptized. Some of you in here, I have baptized. We're talking about water baptism. We're talking about going under the water, and then we're coming up out of the water. But what does that sign, that symbol, actually represent? And what I want to <clears throat> implore you to believe today is that, in, in essence, that going under the water and that coming back out of the water is actually a symbol of what the Bible is referencing, what happens to you when you are Save when you are converted, when you go from spiritual death to spiritual life, when you become a Christian. I believe that that is a symbol, that, that baptism of this Holy Spirit baptism that we're going to study today that, that, that happens to every one of us at conversion, when you become a Christ follower. A lot of verses that, 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 uh, that, that really talk about this baptism of the Holy Spirit, some of them are looking into the future. John the Baptist kept talking about Jesus is going to come and he's going to baptize you in with of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus comes along and he says, in, 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 in the future, I'm going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And then later, like in a few days, I'm gonna, and then it, then it actually happens. And so, let's jump right in. Let's look at it. All these references to baptism of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 3. <clears throat> this is John the Baptist. This is not John, Jesus' closest friend who wrote the Gospel of John and took care, took care of Jesus' mother. Not that John. This is John the Baptist who was in some way roughly related to Jesus. Some people say like he's his cousin, but just some ways roughly related. John answered them all. Here's what he said. I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come. He's talking about Jesus. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So there's that phrase, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's undeniably throughout Scripture. What do we do with it? Next passage. John, I'm sorry, that, that one was, that one that I just read was Luke 3. John chapter 1, another account of what John the Baptist is, 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 is predicting will happen. Then John gave this testimony. He says this, I saw the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him who, on Jesus. The Holy Spirit came down like a dove and remained on Jesus. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, told me this. He said, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain <clears throat> is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Again, John, it, several times in his life, says, I'm, uh, I'm merely here to baptize you with water, a sign of repentance. 
And that's what it was in the days of John the Baptist. It was merely, and I don't mean that disparagingly, but it was merely a sign that, hey, I want to, I want to change my ways. I want to repent. I don't want to live the way I used to live. I want to live in a, in a new, go in a new direction. So that was the sum total of John the Baptist's water baptism was a sign a symbol of my desire to repent, to go in a new direction. But John says, make no mistake about it, Jesus is going to come in power and might, and he will baptize you in a totally different way with the baptism of with in the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 1, Jesus' words. Jesus says, on one, occa- or, on one occasion, while Jesus, he was eating with them. He, Jesus, gave them this command. Now, understand, this is, this is post-resurrection Jesus. This is Jesus with nail-scarred hands. This is Jesus with a, a, a spear um, wound or scar in his side. This is Jesus who beat death, reanimated himself, came back to life from death, walked out of the tomb, Jesus, Jesus is sitting with his disciples. Imagine that, and they're a little like, Jesus is here. We saw Jesus die, but now he's back, and he's here with us, and he's talking to us, and we're eating together. And, and, and on one occasion, while he, Jesus, was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem. What, what time period are we talking about right now? Somewhere between day one, Passover, and day 50, Pentecost, somewhere in there, somewhere in there, day 20, 30, whatever, somewhere in there, Jesus is sitting with them, and he says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, <clears throat> which you have heard me speak about, for, ba- for, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, so there it is again, and I've only given you just a, a scant portion of all of the references in the Gospels uh, to this baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've only read a few, but you can go and, 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 and research it and search it out, and you'll see that there are many. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this concept, this teaching, this that we were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, first of all, let's actually read about it happening because John the Baptist is predicted, predicting that it will come. God spoke to John the Baptist and told him that it would come. Jesus, um, Jesus uh, told them that he, the Holy Spirit, would come upon them and baptize them. Now let's read about the actual act. Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> the day of Pentecost came. When the day of Pentecost came, <clears throat> they were all together in one place. They're all together in one place in a, in a let's, let's call it a house. But, but, but Jews from all over the region were all together in one place, the city of Jerusalem. Verse 2, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Okay, who, who are they? Who are these people that are sitting in this house? They are the apostles, the 12 apostles of Jesus, and probably some of Jesus' other closest friends, his closest um, entourage, those who followed him for three years. The 12 apostles, probably a few others, they're sitting in the room, suddenly a sound blowing, uh, a, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house, And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. So 12 or 15 or 20 little, little, what seemed like little uh, tongues of fire on on their heads. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 
Okay, so now this is what's happening. This is what Jesus told them would happen. And that is that they, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is now coming upon them. Imagine, imagine this, this house that they're in just being, I'll use the verb, wrecked by the violent wind that is sent from heaven. And I don't believe anyone was, was injured, but it's wrecked to the point, this is how I see it, that, that other people in, like, like in Jerusalem, like there's something going on over there and, because there's no wind anywhere else, well, you know, but, but there it's wrecked by the wind. And so they're, they're already gravitating, moving toward this house because a violent wind blew. The apostles see tongues of fire resting on their heads uh, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. They speak in tongues, verse 5. Now they were, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Why? Because as I already told you, it's, it's, the, it's this harvest, this grain harvest festival, a pilgrimage. They were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Verse 6. <clears throat> when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. Again, read that with me. When they heard the sound... Is it the wind? Is it these foreign tongues? When they heard the sound, they came together <clears throat> um, in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Now, we've talked about that before. Jesus and his closest friends were from Galilee, like they were from the countryside. They weren't from Judea. They weren't um, citified type of people. Uh, they were from the country. They were from Galilee. They had their own, their own uh, di not really dialect, but they had their own colloquialisms and their own sort of draw, like they're from the country. And so they, the Galileans are speaking in other languages. We recognize them uh, Again, verse 7, utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Verse 8, then how is it that each of us hears them in our native tongue? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own languages. So these Galilean fellas um, who did not speak other languages from other countries, all of a sudden, supernaturally, they're able to speak all these other languages. Verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. And we'll stop the reading there. Just so you know, it's about 9 o'clock in the morning. And they're already, because of what's going on, they're writing them off as being drunk. And how often do we, when we see things that we don't necessarily understand, that might be the moving of the Holy Spirit, how often do we write it off as well as being drunk? mere nonsense. Let me tell you the rest of the story because we could read on and on and on Acts chapter 2 and into Acts chapter 3, but what happens at that point is that Peter, who's sort of the head apostle, some call him the father of the church, um, Peter sees this supernatural opportunity. All of these Jews have, have now, their attention has been captured and Jesus, uh, Peter gets up and preaches. And he says to these Jews, um, this should, number one, not be uh, misinterpreted as being uh, drunk revelry. You know, it's only nine in the morning. No, if it was in three in the afternoon, I don't know what he would have said, but it's, like, it's only nine in the morning, so they, they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not drunk, so don't mistake it for that. And then he begins to remind the Jews with Scripture of, what God has been telling them all along for, for 
since the inception of their nation that ultimately a Savior would come, ultimately a Messiah would come, and that is Jesus. And you guys, remember we crucified him. And then he beat death, and he walked out of the tomb, and he begins preaching the gospel, and then he tells them this, this, this often overlooked verse. He, he quotes uh, an Old Testament prophet, Joel, and he says, God told us this, God told us that in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And he goes on saying, God told us that, that this would happen. God told us that, 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 that in the last days, uh, I, don't, I don't really interpret that to mean like the last days, like before the tribulation. I mean, the last days meaning Jesus ushered in a new age, this last era, this new covenant era, and, in, and, and upon Jesus beating death, the, the, the new things are going to hap, will happen. The Holy Spirit will move in new and fresh ways. In this age, I'll call it the church age. And so on that day, Peter preaches the gospel, the story of Jesus, and some of you know what happens. That day, 3,000 Jews convert to Christianity. 3,000 Jews are added to the church that day. How many of them were there on a pilgrimage and then took the gospel back to their homeland? Uh, and how many of them were actually native uh, to Jerusalem and stayed there? We don't know. We don't know that. But 3,000, imagine that. Imagine if, if, if that were to happen um, in front of you. If someone stood up and preached the gospel and 3,000 people that day said, I want to bend the knee to Jesus. I, I believe that Jesus, I didn't before, but I now believe that Jesus is the Messiah and I want to follow him. 3,000 people are, 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 are saved that day and that is the birth of the New Testament church. There was no church before that day. That was not a word that was used. Okay, so the big question is this. The big question, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And first of all, I just want to make this super clear. I think I really already have, but I want to make this super clear that I believe that, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens at conversion. Um, some some in, other, in other churches, maybe a church that you grew up in, a denomination that you grew up in, um, would, would say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that happens, happens subsequently, later on. And they might ask you questions that troubled you, like, have you, I know you're a Christian, but have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? I understand that question. I have friends that ask me that question. I, I push against that theology. I believe that, and I'm going to show you in Scripture, uh, and we can do more research later. I'm going to do a Zoom video or a Zoom call in a few weeks, and we're going to talk about more about this. But, but, the, but the, I believe that baptism happens at, the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens at conversion. The idea of there being sort of two-class Christianity those who are saved but have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit and those who have been saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit to class Christianity, I think is, is harmful. Uh, it, and I think it's, I don't think Scripture supports that. Um, baptism of the Holy Spirit at conversion. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit's activity in the life, in your life, at the point of conversion. Conversion, you know what I mean, where you weren't a Christ follower, and then you decided to submit your life to Christ. Something spiritual, something supernatural happens. Your spiritual eyes are opened. You are 
It is the beginning of your Christian life, and two things happen. We're not going to project these, so you might write them down or whatever. Uh, two things happen at the beginning of your Christian life. This is what I mean by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit gives us new spiritual life. The big theological term for that is regeneration. The Holy Spirit gives us new spiritual life. We've been talking about this for weeks. When you are um, not a Christ follower, you are spiritually dead. You can't you, you, you read Scripture, and it makes little or no sense to you. There is no sense of there being um, uh, a desire for Scripture or, or a hunger to know more of God's Word. You're spiritually dead. But then when the Holy Spirit baptizes you, you are regenerated. There is spiritual life, and the Holy Spirit now gives you eyes to see the spiritual realm. The second thing that happens um, at this point of conversion when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, the second thing that happens is this. The Holy Spirit cleanses us from sin and He gives us a clean break from sin. What used to have its fangs, its grips, its claws in us, that being sin, the Holy Spirit releases that and now you have freedom from that. In other words, you don't, you're not obligated to sin. Um, and that is the beginning of this work of sanctification. That's the big theological term. This, th that, that is, that, at that point begins the Holy Spirit's work of sanctification in your life. Rooting out sin. Giving you the power and the desire to resist sin and seek righteousness in your life. So that's what happens at the point of conversion. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. You are regenerated. You come to life spiritually and you are sanctified or at least the beginning of sanctification happens in your life and that is the, the breaking of your sin patterns. There is one baptism of the Holy Spirit into which we are all baptized. But, but, there are, in the Apostle Paul's writings, numerous invitations to be again and again and again filled with the Holy Spirit. Time and time again, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So-and-so is full of the Holy Spirit. Don't resist the Spirit. Desire the Holy Spirit. Be filled time and time again. We're, we're going to look at them. Uh, and so I would say that this filling of the Holy Spirit, which happens subsequent, later on, time and time again, throughout the life of the believer, this, this, this filling of the Holy Spirit is an event subsequent to conversion in which a believer experiences a fresh infilling with the Holy Spirit. And it results in numerous consequences. There are numerous consequences, numerous results. Um, as a result of being filled, subsequently filled once again uh, with the Holy Spirit, uh, some of the consequences include a greater love for God. And even if you're not really into like being filled with the Holy Spirit or that's not your language or your lingo, you know how you would say like, you know, I just, I've been, my heart has been really s sort of cold, but now I just feel like I've this, there's this renewal. I just like, my, my love for the Lord has grown. Some of you would speak in, those la in, in that language. Another, another consequence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is greater victory over sin. You might say like, I've been, I felt like this sin... I know theologically, biblically this isn't true, but I felt like this sin just owned me, but now I feel like, like this, this renewed sense of victory over that sin. Another result of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Another result would be greater power for ministry. There are numerous stories 
in which a minister, a missionary, feels like his ministry, her ministry is not really, there's no traction, there's nothing really happening. And then there's this fresh infilling. And then it's a season of harvest. It's a season of fruitfulness. Last, <clears throat> although there are others, last consequence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit that I will list. Sometimes, uh, as a result, you receive a new spiritual gift. All right, examples of being filled with the Holy Spirit in Scripture. We're just going to blow through these. One would be <clears throat> that when believers pray, <clears throat> there's a fresh infilling. For we, um, let's go on to uh, Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 4, rather. After they prayed... This isn't Pentecost. This is two chapters later. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. Here it's not talking about speaking in tongues. Here it's merely talking about having this new sense of boldness to, to speak God's Word out in the marketplace. Um, another example of being filled with the Holy Spirit in Scripture is that it's a requirement for spiritual leaders. Acts chapter 6 says this, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you. This is talking about the choosing of the original deacons of the church. Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. Now, so what is the... Just this, if, you just, if you just apply logic to this statement, logically what you would have to say is, that, that, that the, the, the implication here is that some people are more full of the Holy Spirit than others. Now, now that's troubling, right? And, and, and I, I wanna, I'm going to work that out here in a minute. But how, like, if we have the Holy Spirit, how can we be less full or more full? Or, like, what does that even mean, Pastor? It doesn't even make sense. But, but at least let's first agree that there does seem to be that implication here. Pick from your church, when you're going to choose deacons, pick people. This should also be true of elders, pastors. Pick people who are full of the Holy Spirit. It sounds like you could be maybe less full. Okay, um, another example of being filled with the Holy Spirit in Scripture, God's powerful presence in times of trouble. Man, don't we need this? In times of trouble... Again, this may not be your language. You may not be so much into the language of the Holy Spirit, but you would say, I went through a dark day, but the Lord went with me. The infilling of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 7. But Stephen, who's about to be killed with rocks because he is a Christian. We call that being a martyr, right? Stephen, he is, some would say, the original, the very first person to be martyred for his faith. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he died that day for the name and the fame of Jesus Christ, full of the Holy Spirit. Um, last example I'll give you, uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit is also uh, described as the, the mark of a mature Christian. Barnabas, one of my three or four favorite characters in the New Testament. I like Barnabas because he's got qualities that I want to have. He's a reconciler. He's a peacemaker. He brings people together. He brings them back to the table. He's that guy. We have a few of those types of people at River Church, but many of us aren't really Reconcilers. Barnabas was, and what does it say? Acts eleven twenty four says, He, Barnabas, was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. All right. What is this? What is this baptism of the Holy Spirit? How can that, how can that be? you might ask, Pastor Randy, if we receive, if we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we receive the Holy Spirit. He is our power for living. Jesus says, I'm gonna, said, I'm going to go away. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit in power in my, and it will be better for you. He lives in us. He um, instills in us 
spiritual life and the ability to resist sin. We all have received the Holy Spirit. It, I, I, would, as, I, would, I would agree that like, that's a mystery, borderline, that doesn't even make sense. How could we have, be baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and yet be, again, filled with the Holy Spirit? And so, first of all, First of all, let's agree that there are mysteries in the Bible that we cannot fully understand, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Having said that, here is my best assessment of what being filled with the Holy Spirit might mean, because I want this for you. I want this for me. Number one, I think it, it, it means, it means uh, simply a deeper awareness of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that we already have in us. Do you understand what I mean? Like the Holy Spirit is living in us, but, but, but we're not aware of it. We're not activating it. We're not taking advantage of it. We're living as though uh, kind of in denial. We're not, we're not aware of the power and the presence. And then the second, uh, this is just my best assessment, how can we describe the infilling of the Holy Spirit? The second way that I would describe it is that it is, um, the, the filling of the Holy Spirit is a breaking from a tendency that many of us have to resist the Holy Spirit. Over the last several weeks, we've looked at a number of passages that are talking about, oh, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And, and many of us, we do that. We, the Holy Spirit is in us, but we resist. We grieve. We push Him down. We, we don't want. We're too afraid. We don't. <clears throat> and, and so as a result of, of that, of this pushing down, what really happens is, rather than being led by the Holy Spirit, we are led by the spirit of fear. I, I don't even necessarily like that phrase, the spirit of fear, but it is actually in the Bible. Um, and I looked at it this week, and I looked at it in the Greek, trying to think, okay, it doesn't really say that. It must not actually say that, but it, it does. Paul in 2 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 7, we're not going to project it, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, he says that, that God has not given you the pneuma, the spirit, the pneuma, same word, the spirit of fear. But some of us, we have so resisted and we have so pushed down and denied the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that actually what is controlling us is the spirit of fear. And without getting too, too personal or, or acting as though I read your mail, many of us in this room today operate mostly under the power of the spirit of fear. That, that largely defines you. You get up in the morning and, and the way you act and the way you react in life is born out of fear that owns you. And the Apostle Paul says, God has not given us the, the spirit of fear. God has given us the Holy Spirit, power, might, boldness, strength, effectiveness, <clears throat> so, what do we do? You know, what do we do? Do we, do we conjure up something where I get you up here and I blow on you and you fall down on the ground or I wave my blazer over you and, and you, you're slain in the Spirit? Do we, do we all get up here? Like, what do we do? I mean, we've all seen so much fakery that we're all, we're all resistant, many of us are resistant to it, aren't we? What do we do? I was driving to work this morning. I was driving to church this morning, and I, this is my thing. It has been for the last few years. I love listening to um, 1940s 
radio. If you want to know how you do that, I can tell you another time, right? But you listen to 1940s radio. So I do that, and there's some commercials in it. And there's a commercial that I'm happy to say I'm not even old enough to remember, but a few of you might. And it's a Coca-Cola commercial, and it says this. It's talking about drink Coca-Cola. It's refreshing, and it says this. It says, it says, Coca-Cola, the pause that refreshes. I don't want to know if you remember that. Uh, but, but, but that's a really, really old, the pause that refreshes. Fast forward to 2022. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not affirming nor uh, chastising this this, um, this campaign, but, but, but Powerade has a, its own campaign that sounds largely like Coca-Cola's. It goes like this. It says, pause is power. Pause is power. And I looked it up. I did a little re- reading and research when I got here because this was on my brain. And, I, and, it, and I, what this is, is a cam- it's a campaign, pause is power. It is a campaign that celebrates pausing to refuel, rethink, and recharge as a power, as a sign of power, not weakness. Now, those are secular commercials. That's fine. I enjoy Coke Zero. I enjoy Powerade on occasion. Pause is power. Let's pause and refresh. But if we could actually think for a moment on what's really troubling to me about our spiritual lives is for most of us in this room today, there is no pause in our lives. Pastor Randy, I'll never hear from the Holy Spirit. I never hear from the Holy Spirit. I, I, uh, I, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but I just, I just feel dead. I feel dry. I feel like in, in look, two minutes, two minutes on your couch praying, followed by, I'm, let's, like, let's, let's, let's make a run to Starbucks. You will not experience the infilling, the power and the presence and the might of the Holy Spirit in your life. Is the Holy Spirit in you? Absolutely. Is He totally attainable, totally available? Absolutely. But a form of quenching the Holy Spirit is merely never pausing. In in the last few years, one of the things that I feel like I largely have gotten right in the last five or six years is I've learned finally in my life to pause and to wait on God. I mean, by pause, I mean taking 30 minutes, taking an hour and saying, I want to hear from you, Lord. I want to experience the Holy Spirit in power and might. I want you to move in me today. Of all of my failures and successes over the last five years, I believe finally I've gotten that right, and I want to tell you that, that there is a, a tenderness that the Holy Spirit brings. There is a comfort that the Holy Spirit brings. There is an overcoming of the spirit of fear that the Holy Spirit brings that I want for you, that I want for us. A fresh in filling of the Holy Spirit. What I want for you, I want a deeper awareness of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. I want a breaking from the tendency to resist the Holy Spirit. I want that in your life. Finally, finally today, let's return to the Pentecost story. What happened as a result of Pentecost? What happened as a result? Let's read the rest of the story. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We know that, we know that 3,000 people were saved that day, here's what, here's what happened as a result. They, the, the, the 3,000 converts, they devoted themselves, and I'm going to give you four different things that they devoted themselves to. I, I've underlined them myself for emphasis. There's a lot, of, a lot of participles and verbs here, but just trust me that as I've studied it, it really falls under these four main categories that I've underlined. They, the 3,000, as a result of Pentecost Sunday, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. That's one and two. To the breaking of bread and prayer, which loosely falls under these other categories. Everyone was filled with awe. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, and all the believers had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions 
two, this is the third one, to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and the Lord, and this is the fourth one, added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. All right, let's take a quick checkup. We have... We, we don't have much time at all. Let's do a really, really quick checkup. Four things. How are you doing in these areas? If you are, if you feel like that there is no power, effectiveness, growth in one of these areas in your life, ask the Holy Spirit to move. Ask the Holy Spirit to, to, to do something fresh and new in your life in one of these areas. The Holy Spirit moved at Pentecost, and here are the four results. Number one, they were all devoted to the apostles' teaching. I, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. They said, we want, we want to go to church. It was a brand new word for them. We want to go. We want to go to the gathering is really what they, were, what they called it for quite a while. We want to go to the gathering. Let's go hear the word of God preached. We want for that. We want for more of that. There's a freshness. There's a renewal that comes with that. We want for that second thing that they were devoted to. They were devoted to fellowship. What do we call it around here? Well, we call it gospel communities. Maybe we call it community. Uh, what do they call it in some churches? Uh, um, cell groups or small groups, community groups. We call them gospel communities here. You want for that. You want for fellowship. I was just talking to a dear friend the other day, and I was like, you know, and this person was like, yeah, that's absolutely true. You know, like, like part of being a Christian is we don't just get together with people that are just like me and, and just think the way that I... We, we are drawn together in the body of Christ. Uh, we are drawn together with the most unlikely of characters. Like the only reason that many of us are friends is not because of similarities and affinities. It's because of the name and fame of Jesus Christ that we adore, that we are... That we are committed to. They were devoted as a result of the Holy Spirit moving in them. As a result of Pentecost Sunday, they were devoted to fellowship. If you don't like going to your gospel community, you may have a Holy Spirit issue. Number three, they were devoted to generosity. I've been reading through the book of Proverbs the last, because uh, I'm reading through the book uh, the, the Bible chronologically, several men in this room are doing that with me, and we meet on Wednesday mornings. And, uh, so we're reading through the Bible, pretty aggressive reading, because you've got to get through the whole Bible in a year. That's, that's a lot of reading. But I've been reading through the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs talks a lot about how the generous person will prosper. There are, there are, there are women and men in this room right now who are generous beyond compare, generous toward the church. Generous toward their friends and their family and their children. Generous people. I don't mean they're wealthy people. I mean they are generous people. And they, according to the Bible, will not run out. I'm not talking about prosperity gospel junk. I'm, I'm saying that, that there are those of us in this room who are, who are led by the Holy Spirit. We, we are going to be generous people. If you are not a generous person, it's not because you're, 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 you're stingy. It's, it's not because you, your mama raised you wrong. If you're just really super like careful, uh, careful is, 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 is actually a good word. If you're just if you're just giving to the Lord out of like a little bit of the top, you know, off of the, but you don't really feel it, it's really not, it's really not going to make a, a difference, you know. The stuff you got in your, your garage, that makes a difference, but the stuff that you're giving to the Lord, not really, doesn't really make, you know, things may rot on your watch, your possessions, but what you're giving to the Lord is just super, super, you know, doesn't, you don't really feel it. Man, the, the, the spirit of fear reigns in your heart, not the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit moves, then people become devoted to generosity. And the last thing is that when the Holy Spirit moved among them, they were devoted to evangelism. The Lord was adding to their number daily. They're like, man, we want more people to experience this. We want to share this. 
Evangelism is born out of the, 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 the moving freely of the Holy Spirit in your life. Generosity is born out of the moving freely of the Holy Spirit in your life. Fellowship, wanting to get together uh, on a Tuesday night or let's say a Monday night rather than staying home for, for, for beer and football, getting together on a Monday night, that, that, is, that is born out of the moving of the Holy Spirit in your life. Wanting to come to church and be taught the Word of the Lord is born out of the moving of the Holy Spirit in your life. What does this look like? I'll give you the, 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 uh, the example of the, uh, of the Apostle Peter. And then, if the band wants to come up, we're going to, we're going to do something a little bit um, in a little bit different order today. We're going to sing, and we're going to quietly, where you are, you sing, you, you, you pray about this matter. You know, if, if you feel like you want to experience the Holy Spirit more deeply in your life, then you, we're going to have one song about five minutes where we can pray and ask the Holy Spirit to move among us. We're going to do that in just a minute. If the band would come on up because we're getting ready to do that. I'll tell you one final case study. That is Peter. Think about this. Peter, one of Jesus' Galilean friends, he's like, Jesus, I'll never abandon you. I will never uh, uh, others may deny you. I'll never deny you. He was a good-hearted man, but he was just a little chicken liver because if you recall, Peter, he's, I, I, I will never abandon you or deny you, Jesus. And Jesus said, you know what? And just the next, uh, the next season here, you, the, you are going to deny me. And Peter was heartbroken. He's like, no, I will never die. And then remember the, the, the night before Jesus was to be crucified? It's dark. It's cold. There's a camp. There's a fire. He's in Jerusalem. He's kind of lurking in the shadows. I'm like, you're, you're one of Jesus' friends, are you? And three times, Peter, of all people, seems like bold, the rock. He, he denies Jesus. Three times, and then he goes off crying, and he goes back to fishing, he goes back to his old job. He thinks, no, Jesus can't use me. But then Pentecost comes. And what happens at Pentecost? Peter is, is, is baptized in the Holy Spirit. What happens just a few, a few chapters later in Acts chapter 10? You can go look at it later. Well, first of all, in Acts chapter 2, what we just read today, he preaches boldly, and the church is birthed. You go through the book of Acts chapter 10, he is moved, there, there's just awesome things happening in his life. Ultimately, we believe that Peter was, he died for the name and fame of Jesus. What, what happened between him denying Jesus and him boldly preaching 3,000 people saved, and he is the father of the church? What happens in between there? The power, the might, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, that you might connect to, experience the fresh, powerful infilling of the Holy Spirit. Let's sing and, and pray over the next few minutes and then we'll run to the table of communion. Let's stand and sing.